right, so this meeting is now being recorded. Welcome everybody to the Amherst Community Chat for Thursday, March 18th. Today we have Amherst Police Captain Ting, uh, Captain Gabe Ting, sorry, and Officer Bill Laramie joining us. Welcome to you both. Thanks for having Thank us. You. <laughs> Thank you. Um, again, I'm Brianna Sunrid, Communications Manager, and we have your Town Manager, Paul Balkerman. So. Before we ask our guests to introduce themselves and start asking questions, I will ask Paul to give any general town updates. Uh, thanks, Brianna. So it's all about the pandemic and the vaccine and moving forward out of this. The governor yesterday announced that um, a schedule for everyone will, who will be eligible for vaccinate, receiving vaccines, which is really exciting. Um, we stand ready to help deliver those vaccines if we're given supply. Right now, we have very limited supply. Um, we are a regional site in conjunction with the city of Northampton. Um, we get a couple hundred doses a week. We, we're capable of doing five or six times that many, even many more than that if we need to. But it's all about supply. Um, as supply increases, we will increase our ability to deliver a vaccine. But people can go um, on the, um, the town's website. It can go on the VaxFinder website. The best play, place to go, I think, is our um, Amherst COVID website that Brianna can reference because all the links are right there. So it's really easy to find everything you need. Um, and UMass, their website is, is available as well because they have a separate sort of standalone system as well. So getting vaccines, having a schedule moving forward, um, having the schools moving towards opening in April, uh, we're on the track of getting back to normal. It will still take many months, but I think we're gonna be going, we're moving in the right direction and we're sort of excited about it. The one thing we worry about is what we're going to talk about today is if there's an increase or breakout uh, outbreak of um, of um, cases in Amherst, which we've already experienced with the university students primarily. And so that's what our mission is over the next few weeks is how do we not let that happen again? So. Great. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'm sure many of our viewers already are uh, familiar with Captain Ting and Officer Laramie, but I'd love for them to just give a quick intro for those who aren't. Uh, Gabe, you're in my top left square. Captain Ting, if you could introduce yourself. Hi everyone, my name is Gabe Ting and I am the operational captain for the Amherst Police Department. I've been here for 24 years and I grew up in Amherst, so I'm a local. Um, I went to the University of Massachusetts as well and um, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Gabe. And I think you grew up up in my neighborhood. So North Amherst. Yes. Drive. Yes. It's the best. All the best people live up there, in my opinion. <laughs> Sorry, Paul. Uh, Officer Laramie, could you introduce yourself, please? Sure. Hi, hey, everyone. Bill Laramie. I am an officer with the Amherst Police, currently assigned in community outreach. I've been here wrapping up 25 years. So my experience here has been diverse you know I've worked kind of all the shifts I was up in the detective bureau a little bit so I would say my assignment now has been the most enjoyable yet most challenging but um yeah particularly now it's a lot of excitement going on so thanks for having me thank you Bill so I just want to remind those who are joining us live feel free to use Q&A to ask your question or just raise your hand in Zoom so we can hear from you live. Uh, we do have some questions prepared so we'll start with that but at any point feel free to chime in. So we all know yesterday typically a big um, event or a week-long type of event St. Patrick's Day and the weeks leading up to it and after it. How, how did it go yesterday? Uh, was there a lot of activities? Were there a lot of parties? Um, what was the impact on your on your team? So, you know, this year has been interesting because there were a lot of changes with the university, certainly with uh, a decreased amount of our population from um, uh, just having about 4,500 freshmen on campus and the majority off campus. So that changed, it, that changed it, the dynamics a little bit. And another portion was that um, certainly COVID plays a big part of it. And uh, the fact that they didn't have a spring break and St. Patrick's Day fell on the 17th. So um, relative to yesterday, it was quiet in regards to parties and celebrations. We didn't receive any noise or disturbance complaints related to this day. Um, 
as you know or may not know, in the past year, St. Patrick's Day is uh, it's celebrated among the, the college community, primarily UMass, during the first Saturday of March. Um, this unsanctioned celebration was coined as the Blarney Blowout. And it really started in 2013, where the bars in Amherst began a bar promotion. And that was to celebrate St. Patrick's Day before the students left for spring break. So that's why it was kind of designated as that weekend. Um, but unfortunately, the bars could only accommodate so many patrons. So the students kind of began to create their own house parties to augment this promotion. And in the following years, it grew and it became a tradition. Um, it grew to thousands of party goers, creating disturbances, fights, destruction of property, underage drinking, and a general sense of chaos throughout the town for that day. Uh, so as a result, you know, the police department, in collaboration with the university police department as well, and the town, we, we started to, to uh, implement many strategies to eradicate this event. And a lot of those strategies are still used today. Um, some of those strategies include uh, Bill's position as the neighborhood liaison officer. We also have a community outreach officer. Um, we constantly monitor social media for this particular event. Uh, we have a strong collaboration with the university and Amherst College. And we also use our mutual aid assistance um, because we only have so many officers here. So really due to COVID regulations, uh, university code of conduct and visitor regulations, and with the bars closed down and a diminished number of students on campus, um, coupled with our outreach and enforcement efforts this year has really been uneventful, which has been, which has been nice. Yeah, that's, that's really good to hear. And I, I wouldn't wonder, you know, with the weather warming up and not necessarily hinged to the, to this specific date or week, um, how have you, are you seeing any parties or gatherings that aren't associated with St. Patrick's Day holiday? You know, it's funny, our, our definition of, of parties or large parties has really changed uh, since COVID had hit. Um, a party of 50 or more was generally considered as a large party. Uh, before COVID, but in today's climate, I would say a party of 10 or more uh, inside or a party of 25 or more is considered too much as we're trying to follow the governor's guidelines to uh, public gatherings. Um, we're responding to our noise complaints. We've been seeing smaller gatherings in general, in general, usually about 15 to 20 people or so. So it, it appears that the students by and large are trying to uh, comply. Um, but there have been a few instances of larger gatherings. Um, probably two weekends ago, we had a large gathering of about 300 college kids partying in uh, one of the quads at, at Townhouse. Um, and I think that's part of it is, is the weather was really compliant in that day. Um, and I know that uh, some of the students are getting kind of stir crazy and it's part of their culture to, to want to go out and socialize. And, and I certainly understand that. Um, so with that being said, we try to be as reasonable as possible. Um, we try to see the viewpoint from every angle, from the student population to the university administrator's view, to our, our town's view, as well as the, uh, our town's permanent population's view. Um, so as a police agency, really it's a balancing act to ensure public safety and not to create any resentment from any of the groups that are involved. Um, so in order for us to educate, there, it's necessary to involve a component to hold violators accountable as well. So our strategy has been to provide outreach first and then to issue fines rather than arrest uh, when there are violations. And then we refer the students back to their university or the college that they're affiliated with. So, so far this process has worked really well. It's been a, a really good deterrent. And how have things changed pre and you know, during COVID, is your response to these types of large gatherings? Have you had to approach them differently when, when officers um, go to go on scene, or what's different this year versus last year, or actually, maybe two years ago? It's true. At this point, <laughs> um, how would I say it's different? It, it's changed quite a bit because we have to keep in mind that uh, we want to keep our officers safe as well as the community in terms of of catching COVID because if if, if we can't help ourselves and it makes it difficult to help others. Um, so COVID, COVID has really impacted us, causing us to change some of the ways that we do things. 
Um, you know, all of our officers have worked through this pandemic, so nobody has, has uh, been working remotely. So we've been here the whole time, which means that we have to take special precautions and make sure that, that we're all safe. Because uh, essentially an outbreak would have really crippled us for quite some time. And, uh, and honestly, I think we've done a really good job in preventing that from happening. Yeah, that, I think that was our, our biggest fear was, I think our biggest fear, Gabe and Bill was, if the fire department or police department or dispatch um, they had a had a, a contagion in their in the building because you're in those buildings you can't help but be in those buildings and um, and we worried about that with DPW too because it's water wastewater these are all essential activities that the town performs and that was our biggest fear and it, it, we've we survived it so far and we're really and it's a due diligence by our staff and the and the employees of the town. I agree. Yeah, thank you for recognizing that. You know, we, I think that uh, all of our departments have done a phenomenal job. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the changes, first and foremost, we want to make sure that all of our officers are following the rules. You know, we can't really expect the public to comply if we're not doing it as well. So some of the changes internally were operational changes. So we had to limit groups, um, group sizes, sharing spaces, donning masks and cleaning routines. Um, externally, we would employ methods to meet with people over the phone uh, or electronically, such as right now, or outside as much as possible. So we also try to avoid physical custodies if possible, and we chose to issue fines or criminal summonses if that was necessary. So, you know, again, we try to really um, try to educate versus uh, enforcement. Enforcement was really used as a uh, last resort. So... You know, I, I guess people would probably ask about car stops too. Initially, when COVID first hit, we again, in our efforts to try and limit any contact, we tried to curtail our motor vehicle stops. Um, that was kind of tough because we recognized that, or one of our fears was that if we stopped stopping cars, that there'd be an uptick in, in traffic crashes and whatnot. So fortunately, we haven't really seen that in town. I think there was an uptick nationally with uh car crashes and whatnot, but certainly in Amherst, I think there were um, other factors, other variables, certainly uh, the population was smaller. Um, and, uh, you know, there just wasn't, the, the bars were closed and there just weren't as many activities. So that kind of uh, helped us out in that sense. Uh, for large gatherings in town, um, again, we've only really seen them with, uh, with the college student population. So we've worked closely with our university partners and, our, and certainly with Bill Laramie, the position that he's in. He's uh, been tremendous in helping that effort. Um, and I wanna talk about a little bit about our ambassadors. They've been a big help as well to try and educate this population as much as possible. And Bill's gonna speak to that a little bit more. Um, however, you know, again, we try to be real about things. We are going up against a college culture that's ingrained with this age group in this setting. So there's always gonna be some kind of resistance. Um, so when education fails, we must still hold violators accountable. So. Thank you, Gabe. I wonder if Bill, you could talk a little bit how your position uh, fits in with all of this work and how the ambassadors and, on your, and others on your team, um, what's going on in, in your world right now? What's going on in my world? Where do I start? Uh, At the beginning. <laughs> uh, once upon a time. Uh, yeah, so I would say my work is extremely busy right now. There's a lot of moving parts in terms of my connections at the university, working with property managers. So in terms of like how I look at data and stuff. So on Mondays, you know, I'll kind of pull all of our previous week's reports and then disseminate that as appropriate to property managers, to the university. We meet weekly with the university as well as other officials in town, whether it be our building inspectors, fire department. Can you talk a little bit about those meetings, Bill? That's, I think that's interesting. If people don't know that, that every Monday you have your, what, what do you call it? No, on, on call. On call. Yeah. And who's so, there and what, what do you talk about? So we... Most of the focus at this point is around COVID, shockingly, and around student behavior. So again, when we when we analyze this 
information. We're disseminating it to the university, to our property managers. We discuss what has gone on at APD. So, and, you know, say there's, to give you an example, say there was a, a noise disturbance at a fraternity house or something. We became aware of that. We took some enforcement action. We would share that information with the university. Additionally, we have code enforcement at the table. So I would talk with them. You know, I think it's necessary that we perform an inspection in there. So we'll pull them in and then through an inspection, the fire department becomes involved. So, you know, they're looking at life safety type equipment. And then, you know, the, the Dean of Students, someone isn't within their division of, of conduct. So they're, take, they're doing intake on these cases and meeting out appropriate discipline. Folks may or may not be aware that the level of discipline was ratcheted up quite a bit a few weeks ago. The vice chancellor sent out an email to the students basically saying if you were involved in this townhouse incident that you were considered under interim suspension. That I believe is going to be kind of their standard of going forward through this semester. So that was kind of a, a huge piece of this for us because I feel like as a police department and town collectively, you know, we were giving them information and, you know, looking for them, what is going to be your contribution to this. So by just the language alone, I think was a big step and something we were, we were grateful for. And I, I think since then we've seen, because we had some, and we continue to have some concerns about what the semester is going to look like, you know, what, what's going to happen on that first 70 degree Saturday? What is that going to look like? Are, are there going to be some people who choose to take risks and see how serious the Dean of Students is? Because the reality is, and most people know it is, the punishment we hand out is not as severe as what the university can hand out. So the courts often, you know, can hand out fines, but really the, the university can impact somebody's livelihood and their education. And not that we want to see people thrown out, but, you know, I feel like the, the tone of her email and the seriousness of it will help us going forward. So that is one part of my job. And then the other part is, you know, is really how all this intersects, how public safety intersects with public health. So Pat Newman, if any of you have not had the opportunity to meet her either in person or through some type of Zoom meeting, she was hired last fall as our COVID ambassador coordinator. So she reports to me and then I report to Gabe. And so, you know, she is real dynamic. I've kind of, she comes in high energy. I kind of just give her the guardrails to stay with them. You know, the, and I say to her often, I have a 24 year head start on you. You have to trust me. Like you, you can communicate with me and we can make a decision based upon what you're telling me. So she's the program, I think in its infancy was, was one around simply mass compliance. So we hired some ambassadors. We wanted them visible in the downtown because that's where we had adopted a mass compliance zone. And we were out there just educating people, handing out masks. And then, you know, it's really evolved into much, much more than that. As I knew she wanted to take it in that direction. And I, we do weekly outreach. We're going to do, it's every Friday. We do a three to five. Um, last Saturday, we were out from noon to six. We'll be out from noon to six this Saturday. And, and who's out with you when you go out on those visits? Really, we kind of invite everybody. You know, we, in previous outreaches, we've had property managers come with us. We've had folks like Sally Lenowski from the Off Campus Student Center. She is with us most Fridays. She was out with us last Saturday, and admittedly, last Saturday was was really quiet. But I mean, it's such a it's such a terrific group of people. So we, you know, we made our own. And <laughs> yeah, so you drive by, right? Yeah, we saw you, and we. Saw there's there's somebody in green pants, but they're lying. I think they're involved. That person's got a green tarp on their roof. Are they having a party? You know, <laughs> stuff like that. It Does was Winston go out with you on these. Winston, with us. Oh yeah, yeah. So if you look at Winston's Instagram, he's he had a terrific day. He likes that we got to use the AFD van, and it's got really big windshields. So he kind of sits up there and is like king of the world for for the afternoon. So and he's been very well received. You know, I think that's. And we can talk a little bit about him, but I don't want to occupy too much time. But I mean, he's been, as we would expect, a really nice connection piece. We're going to 
whomever it may be, you know, he's participated in a lot of the vaccination clinics. And I've heard a lot of, a lot of positive feedback from attendees as well as people staffing it. Like he just kind of lowers the temperature there. Cause I mean, there's people that walk into these clinics and it was evident to me the first one I went to and I, I was looking at this as a healthy 50 year old male. And then I went to this and saw people that, you know, this was a big, big deal for them to have this vaccination. So for him to be there and do his thing and he's doing really well. So you that's can follow kinda... him on Instagram if you're not already. Um, what's the handle, Bill? Uh, it's Winston at APDMA. Winston APDMA. If you just type in Winston, I don't know what it is. Yeah, he'll be your first hit. And he's got a great narrative. He's up to lots of good things if you really want to keep keep up to date with uh, Winston. Yeah, so I'm his, I'm his driver, his leash holder, and his, I'm also his editor on his Instagram. So we... <laughs> Our daily activity. So that is, I mean, that kind of summarizes what we do. I feel like we have a really good team in place. I was actually just Deputy Chief Ian Sear from UNPD shared a an article from Boulder, Colorado. They had a major incident a couple weekends ago with some student conduct. And, you know, there was a summary of like what they're doing and what they should be doing and a lot of both what they were doing and what they should be doing, we are doing everything. So, you know, I feel like there's no, in students, you know, I have a lot of meetings with students in leadership positions and they, I think they're, I don't know if, if they're pleasantly surprised, but they're surprised how much I know, you know, and I bring to the table. So it's good. And it, for me, it's really about transparency and building trust, the problem we have is that in these leadership positions they change annually so by the time you've built up that that trust and transparency it's time to bring in a new person so we're we're working through that stuff i think it's you know again with the team we have assembled people are committed to this work so i think we can move it in a good direction and we're hiring for more covid ambassadors right now is that correct we are yes yeah and so can you talk a little bit about you know who should apply? I mean, we're looking for people with various different age levels, experiences. Or... Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think, I think we're really looking for anybody, like if you're in high school, if you're a retiree, looking to pick up some extra hours, if you, you know, you're an active person, you're outgoing. I think those are two big things. You're, you're uh, pliable in terms of like the mission changes often, you know, what you think you might be doing one day, you may be thinking you're coming in to do a walking shift and then you're assigned to, you know, going over to a vaccination station. So, but they've been the people that CAT has, has hired, they've been terrific. You know, they're all really good folks. Some of them are townies. Some of them are UMass alumni. Some of them were frankly looking for a job, but, you know, we've kind of molded them into a really high functioning team. So it's been fun to watch. Yeah, I really second that. I mean, the ambassadors, whenever we've, you know, obviously full-time staff here who've been here for a while and working on COVID response, we found, as you said, the mission changes, the information changes from the state and we have to pivot quickly. And the ambassadors have been really responsive to us sending them a request for help at the last awesome. minute and they're there. And also answering the phones for folks. And I think that's a high priority thing as well, because a lot of people just call with concerns and we're able to staff the, the COVID hotline on weekends with ambassadors, which has been a huge help. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you re regarding that, and I can tell folks who may be listening. So part of the, our operational plan, at least within my wheelhouse of having ambassadors out on the weekend is we're going to deliver like real-time response. So that's kind of our plan. So the ambassador answering the hotline will get in touch with me and we can actually go and just have a conversation with people. We're not going there too. It's education and outreach. It's not about enforcement in the context of my work. So we're just going to go there real time and have conversations with people. So that's another important piece because I feel like a lot of our calls, again, there's this intersection between public health and public safety. So I can go down there and evaluate as this where are we at? Is this public health or is this public safety or is a little bit of both? So that's kind of what we're going to do. And that, I was talking with Captain Ting this morning about, 
you know, what it's going to look like going forward in terms of our operational posture. And I think, you know, I think it's going to be weather dependent. I think it's going to be based upon really the students control, the students and the weather control how, how our department responds, I think. Am I correct, Captain? Yeah, I would say so. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> so I know we only have a couple minutes left. I do want to touch on a different topic, um, if it's okay. So we all are aware of the, the shootings that happened in, in Atlanta um, earlier this week. And um, we live in a very diverse community and you know, with a lot of, uh, and I just wondered, you know, and I know our uh, police department um, recognizes that. And when we do hiring and promotions, we talk a lot about that and like what, what you need to have to be working in the town of Amherst. Um, and is, is in terms of the police response um, in reaction to that, do you have any comments on that? Uh, I certainly do. You know, I'm going to echo that sentiment that the, the town of Amherst is so unique that we have a segment of population that really represents any ethnicity or culture in the world. Um, when something of this nature happens and it's in the national spotlight, uh, we can usually associate it with our own town in some shape or form. Um, mm. Certainly the Asian population in town is about 11% and that's, that's about the same with the uh, university population. So in terms of minority groups, uh, the Asian population is really the largest in town. Um, so in terms of in speaking for the police department, we certainly denounce any violence and specifically any violence that's racially motivated. Uh, this is something that we have been monitoring closely We've seen very few instances, for, uh, fortunately, in town um, thus far, and we hope to keep it that way. Uh, we wish to protect all of our citizens and visitors in Amherst and encourage anyone who has encountered any instances of hate to bring it to our attention. Um, we're not going to tolerate it. We're certainly going to enforce all laws possible from that. So it's certainly at the forefront, and it's, it's, it's really a sad situation. And, mm -hmm. uh, and we'll keep an eye on it. Great. Great. Thank you, Gabe. So as Paul mentioned, we are um, coming up at the end of our time. It goes by quickly, as we say. So um, Bill, Gabe, anything that you want to leave the community members with that you didn't get asked directly in the last few minutes? Go ahead, Cap. I just want to say, certainly, I, we appreciate this opportunity to be able to reach out. You know, a lot of times, uh, I feel like there's there's potential lack of opportunities to reach out to, to the community, and this is one great way to to kind of uh, expose ourselves and to have the opportunity to come in and, and ask questions. And certainly, if, if there's no questions here today, you know, give me a call anytime. I'll be more than happy to to speak with anybody. Great, thank you. And I and guess Bill? I would echo that too. I mean, my job in community outreach is just that being part of the community and as we continue to improve here, you know, I've, I've sat in and many, many more Zoom meetings than I would like. So I've kind of changed my approach a little bit. I, you know, I call them moving meetings. So if there's something you want to discuss, I have a dog that needs walking. So I'll meet you in your neighborhood and we can, we can take a walk and discuss any issues they might have. I feel that way is much more productive and it allows me to get Winston some exercise. So reach out anytime. I'll be calling you after this show. All right, let's do it. <laughs> All right, well, we wanna say thank you to you both. I know you're very busy and we appreciate you making time. Uh, this session will be, is recorded and we'll post it up to our community chat channel um, if anybody wants to share it later. Again, thank you both and have a yeah. great day. Thanks guys. Thank you, thank Brianna. You. Appreciate it.